Rebel Moon Part 1 A Child of Fire opens with some exposition that is heavy-handed, packed with information whilst simultaneously communicating virtually nothing of use, and is borderline incomprehensible if you think about it for longer than the time it takes to get to the opening title. We are told that on the Mother World, 1,000 kings ruled unchallenged in succession, but that during these 1,000 years the royal bloodline became too greedy in their lust for power and so they consumed everything upon their planet. The realm then marched its armies into the vastness of space, which one would have thought would be something of a challenge given that they have just drained the Mother World of all natural resources, but one would have to be paying attention to notice this discrepancy and so I can already tell that I am not the target audience for this movie. Then, one day, the king and queen were assassinated, which severed the royal bloodline forever. Which is not how bloodlines work, unless of course the king and queen had no living relatives, which would be something of an oddity after tens of thousands of years of monarchy. Of course, I could be being unreasonable. It absolutely could be the case that it simply works differently on the mother world to how it does in real life. It could be that, as decreed by the royal bloodline, when the king and queen die, the chain of succession is irreparably broken, which would be a somewhat counterproductive way to run your civilization if its system of leadership can be severed entirely through the careful placement of a couple of sharp objects. But anyway, that is apparently how it works in Rebel Child Part 1 A Moon of Fire, so let us continue. After the king was assassinated, several of the planets the Mother World had conquered previously began to whisper of revolution. A senator named Balisarius, who was neither the Archmagos Dominus of the Adeptus Mechanicus, nor was he the person who assassinated the king and queen, I promise that isn't the case whatsoever, decided that he was going to be in charge now. And yeah, that's literally all we get to explain this in the entire movie. And then, as a show of strength, he sent his most brutal commander to find and crush the rebels. What do we learn? In the simplest possible terms, the Mother World are greedy and ruthless. The King and Queen were assassinated for some reason, Balisarius made himself the regent, and he has sent an evil underling to go forth and do evil. When opening a science fiction or fantasy film, you usually want to introduce the audience to the world that the story is going to take place in. There are many ways you can do this. You can open with news footage, such as in Starship Troopers or Edge of Tomorrow, which can allow for diegetic world building as the exposition is coming from content that exists within the world of the story. You can go for the cold open, such as in Ex Machina or The Matrix, to get right to the storytelling and worry about filling the audience in on how everything works later down the line. You can open with a monologue, such as in Pacific Rim, Fury Road, or Dune, which has the added benefit of informing the audience of the character giving the monologue, whilst also establishing the setting. You can even start by just plonking some text on the screen, which principally isn't something I find particularly engaging, as it can be an extremely lazy way to deliver exposition, but Alien and Twelve Monkeys are two examples that manage this without being overbearing. Or alternatively, you can have a shot of a spaceship emerging from a vagina portal, and have an Oscar-winning actor read a bunch of nonsense that only serves to waste the audience's time and confuse the ones who are actually paying attention. We are then introduced to the protagonist of Rebel Moon A Child of Fire Part 1, Cora, who lives on a bland oversaturated orange nightmare because this is, of course, a Zack Snyder movie. She is farming at night, alone, indicating that she works hard and likes to keep to herself. This is extremely surface level characterization, but as we still have the entire movie left to go, there is plenty of time for her to become more nuanced and complex. Yeah, I'm not even gonna pretend that doesn't happen, this character is as simple as beans on toast. Anyway, Gunner tells Cora that they are all partying in the Long House, and we will find out why it is called the Long House soon enough. He says that Den has caught a snow elk, and that the reason Gunner is here is because Den wants Cora to see the elk so that he can impress her. After Cora questions Gunner and he stumbles over his words, it is implied that the story about Den is an excuse for Gunner to talk to Cora, and that what Gunner really wants to do is give Cora a sticky hug. It will be revealed momentarily, however, that the story about Den and his elk is very much real. That Den does want to impress Cora, and that therefore Gunner's mating strategy is to go out of his way to get the girl he likes to play hide the sausage with Den the chaddest chad who ever chatted. Anyway, 
Anyway, every now and then, Mr. Snyder will give us pretty cool visuals. For some reason, however, he seems completely inept when it comes to shooting a scene of two people talking to each other. The cuts between Cora and Gunner in this scene feel totally unnatural because their positions in the frame keep changing arbitrarily, and both characters often appear on the right-hand side of the frame with nothing on the left. This shot here looks pretty normal. The camera is focused on Gunner, and on the left we can see the back of Cora's head. A normal thing to do would be to cut to a reverse shot, where we focus on Cora, who remains on the left, and Gunner remains on the right, which can be seen here in this shot. For some strange reason, however, this happens once, and the rest of the scene is extremely balked when it comes to framing. We instead cut to Cora, who is now on the right, and Gunner is nowhere to be seen. We return to the original shot of Gunner, cut back to the reverse shot, but this time both characters move to the right-hand side of the screen with nothing on the left, resulting in a meaty slab of wasted space populated only by blurry, oversaturated orange nothingness. Then Gunner is in the middle, then Cora is on the right, and then we return to the original shot. Ah, I fucking hate movies. Not every dialogue scene needs to be filmed and edited using shot reverse shot, but there is a reason why that technique is so common. It is very hard to fuck up. For all its faults, at least Rings of Power understood how to do this. Much of Rings of Power consists of two or more people talking to each other, and at no point did my brain detect any fuckery with regard to how these dialogue exchanges were filmed. Conversely, in the very first dialogue exchange of Rebel Fire Part 1 A Child of Moon, we have something that appears to have been filmed by someone who doesn't know how to film a dialogue scene. For the guitarists amongst you, Zack Snyder is that guy who tried to perfect sweep picking before learning how to tune his instrument. Anyway, later that evening, Cora notes that it has been a while since they had fresh meat, and so the film is clearly making sure the audience is aware of the state of food on this particular planet, or moon, maybe. I, I don't know if this is the rebel moon or if the rebel moon is elsewhere. I just don't, I, I don't know. Anyway, this man who is named in the credits as Hagen, but I don't believe is ever named in the film, tells Cora that Den was asking for her, which confirms that Gunner was telling the truth, that Gunner does want to boink Cora, and that his method by which to lure her to the longhouse was to go and tell her a true story about how impressive Den is and how Den wants to fertilize her. I question Gunner's methods here, as his actions seem to be facilitating someone else hooking up with Cora, which is precisely what ends up happening. By the way guys, no we're not watching the wrong film here. This is an epic sci-fi adventure movie, it's just that before we get to that bit, we have to get through the rom-com sex drama portion of the movie. Anyway, we are then introduced to Jarl Bulgruf. It is my duty to remind you that the gods of the harvest demand a tribute. The weight of the leader, I suppose. Who tells everyone that the gods of the harvest demand a tribute, and because this film was made for adults, the required tribute is loud, unprotected sex. Oh dear, whatever will Cora do? She has to choose between Gunner, a man who is nervous, doesn't know how to talk to women, and seems to want Cora to hook up with Den instead of him, and Den, a man with a far more impressive beard and a man whom we have been told repeatedly is super competent and is the best at everything. Naturally, Cora does what every character in the film seems to want her to do, and she plays Den's ding dong all night long. Everybody stop trying to have sex with each other! Afterwards, Hagen tells her how awesome Den is and that they should start a more permanent relationship. I have no idea why the opening 10 minutes of this sci-fi epic consists mostly of uncompelling rom-com sexcapades, and my guess is that Zack Snyder thinks the existence of sexing in a film makes it mature, and Zack Snyder's fans consider his work to be the pinnacle of maturity. Anyway, this discussion between Cora and Hagen is the first scene that contains any notable characterization, so let's go through it. We learn that Cora is an outsider, that she has only been here for two seasons, and that Hagen wants Velt to be her permanent home. Cora then says, hello, allow me to tell you my backstory. She tells him that being here has made her happy, but that she feels she does not deserve this. She states that she is a child of war, that the idea of love was beaten out of her, and that she believes herself incapable of loving someone. All right, this is something I'm going to refer to as the Nori problem. Cora, like Nori from Rings of Power, is not contradictory in her characterization, or at least not yet. 
We have spent the first couple of scenes with her so far and we have a pretty good feel for how she might react to some situations. The problem is in how that information was delivered to the audience. Yes, this characterization is efficient. Yes, this characterization is somewhat justified by her values being challenged by Hagen. Since we met Cora, she has been told by two separate characters, Hey Cora, you should totally hook up with Den because he's a turbo chad who hunts snow elk, and also you should totally get married and live happily ever after because you're an outsider who hasn't been here very long, prompting Cora to then list off her character traits. She tells Hagen and the audience that she feels guilty about her past, that she escaped some kind of trauma, and that this trauma makes her feel she is incapable of settling down and loving someone. This is exposition at its most simplistic and superficial. There is no subtext. There is no deeper meaning. There is nothing to infer. The next morning, we are treated to another conversation about Den crushing Cora's buns before the plot of the film finally starts. What is about to happen is the inciting incident for the story. So far, we have been told about what the Mother World is and how evil they are, and we have been introduced to Cora and her village filled with people who desperately want her to have sex with one particular man. These two worlds are about to collide. A massive spaceship appears overhead, we get more slow motion seeds, and Cora runs to warn the village. The villagers all seem to be understandably afraid of and intimidated by the presence of this ship, presumably because they are essentially medieval peasants, but Jarl Bulgruf says, What do you think they want? indicating that they, or at least he, is aware of the mother world and has some kind of understanding of what space travel is. This moment makes me wonder why the previous scene in which Cora tells the audience all of her character traits was necessary. By having her freak the fuck out seemingly inexplicably upon seeing a mother world ship in the sky, this raises questions in the audience's mind that have the potential to deepen the character. Is she on the run? Are they looking for her? Are they going to kill everyone here? All reasonable questions, questions that would have been far more compelling had this been our introduction to the character. Make the audience engage their brains and speculate. Make them piece together your characters by showing them how they respond to different situations. As it turns out, however, the use of a brain is not necessary when watching Moonchild Part 1 A Rebel of Fire, so we will continue. Jarl Balgruf thinks the existence of a warship in their skies cannot be good, and he doesn't care how they could potentially benefit. We know this because he says, I don't care what the potential upside might be. A warship hanging over our lands cannot be good. This fits with his single character trait, that he is a traditionalist. Gunner tells Jarl Balgruf that his first reaction is always fear, because Zack Snyder has been paying attention to the rules for writing Rings of Power, rule three of which is that the best way to develop characters is to have other characters tell them their own character traits. Gunner knows the Mother World are extremely wealthy, and that therefore they can potentially get loaded with cash and not have to deal with the cutthroats in Providence. This gives us a little bit more world building, and true to form, it makes very little sense, although I will hold off on explaining why for now. In terms of world building, this tells us that the farmers of Velt grow crops to feed themselves, that they sell the surplus for profit, and that their usual buyers are assholes and or criminals from the town of Providence. I will return to this when it continues to not make sense. We learn that Gunner had sold the previous year's surplus to a group of rebels known as the Blood Axes, whom, as we will soon learn, the Mother World are hunting. Gunner then once again says exactly what he is thinking, with zero subtext and zero nuance. Well, I'm no revolutionary. They offered the best price? I don't care about their cause. I don't have a sign, only this community. That's my only loyalty telling us that Gunner is not a revolutionary, he does not care about their cause, and this community is his only loyalty. I have spoken in the past about how important it is to have clearly defined characters, and Gunner is certainly that. Once again, the problem is not that we don't understand who Gunner is. The problem is that Zack Snyder appears to have written down Gunner's character traits, his motivation, and his general outlook on life, and then copied and pasted this from his brainstorming session directly into his script. Anyway, Cora objects to this idea. That ship does not represent prosperity. Its purpose is to destroy, to subjugate, to enslave. Partnership is not in its vocabulary. Again, quite clearly communicating that Cora knows a lot more than she is letting on. For some inexplicable reason, however, none of the villagers react to this. No one questions why Cora knows any of this. We don't get a sense for what anyone thinks about what she just said. 
And the reason this doesn't happen is because that would force Zack Snyder to reveal information about Korra's past that he is not ready to reveal just yet, because oh boy does he have a super smart way to integrate this character's fantastic backstory into the greater narrative. Jarl Bulgruf agrees with Korra and says they will be friendly to their visitors, but they will not engage in any kind of exchange of goods. We are then introduced to Admiral Atticus Noble, the brutal commander sent by Balisarius to hunt the rebels as stated in the opening monologue. This being an evil character who is here to do evil things, naturally, he looks about as evil as is possible, appearing like an approximation of an Imperial Guard commissar who in turn look like a sci-fi version of a Nazi officer. Because we already know that this character is evil, naturally, the film decides to waste time by trying to pretend that he is not. I'm Admiral Atticus Noble, representative of the Slain King. I welcome you to his warm embrace. I will return to why Noble pretends to be a nice person after outlining the rest of the scene. Admiral Noble reveals that he is looking for help whilst he searches for a band of revolutionaries, the Blood Axes, and that what he wants from the villagers is food for his soldiers. Admiral Noble's decision to travel to Velt to get food for his soldiers is what allows the plot of the film to happen. So quite unfortunately for the writers, I have more than a few things to highlight. The Imperium is a galaxy-spanning force with countless soldiers. They have access to a ridiculous amount of resources. They appear to be capable of some kind of warp travel or other means of faster-than-light transportation. They have conquered and subjugated many planets. We were literally told in the opening monologue that they have conquered everything in their path. Their supply ports in this region, however, have been attacked by the Blood Axes, and due to either a logistical error or a simple lack of forethought, they found themselves running low on food. Naturally, Admiral Noble decided that a small farming village was the ideal place to acquire enough food for his army. This decision relies on multiple things that I do not think are at all coherent with the world we have seen so far. There are no better locations Admiral Noble could have acquired food from. There are no larger settlements, there are no cities, there are no trading hubs, there are no entire fucking planets dedicated to agriculture. This does not line up at all given the apparent scale of the setting, plus the fact that later in the film we visit a planet that is entirely dedicated to mining, for example. This also requires that Noble somehow knew about the existence of this extremely small and seemingly remote village of farmers, and decided, oh boy, these backwards peons are absolutely my best bet at feeding my army. Anyway, Noble offers them triple the market value. However, Jarl Balgruf refuses the generous offer, as he was convinced earlier by Korra that the Imperium are the bad guys. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense, given that, as we soon learn, the villagers have a lot of surplus food. Yes, it is more than likely that Noble has no intention of actually paying them, but given what Korra revealed about the Imperium earlier, this would be the best case scenario. Rather than accepting Noble's offer, which would have been the only smart thing to do in this scenario, naturally, Jarl Balgruf decides to piss him off by lying to him, firstly by claiming that they don't want buckets of cash to buy robots to do the harvesting for them, and again by claiming that, oh, actually it just so happens that we don't, we, we don't have any food to offer you even if we did want to sell it to you. Noble then casually interrogates Gunner, being the one responsible for overseeing the harvest and selling the surplus. Gunner reveals to Noble that they actually do have surplus, but they keep it in case of famine or drought. He goes on to specify that they have been lucky in the last few seasons, and that they have more food than they can store. That's a damn stupid thing to do. On the one hand, Gunner told the camera earlier that he will sell to whoever offers the best price, and so therefore he is interested in forming an agreement with Admiral Noble for the betterment of the village. However, he is also a colossal tit, because he has just contradicted Jarl Bulgruf's claim that they have no surplus food, and at this point, despite his polite demeanor, Admiral Noble has been unambiguously, persistently, and obviously intimidating. Regardless, Gunner appears to genuinely think that there will be no consequences for him revealing that Jarl Bulgruf was lying, which makes him incredibly naive. I can believe that a young farmer who grew up isolated from the greater evils of the universe might be unaware of just how bad people can get, but Gunner is the guy who travels to Providence and personally makes deals with cutthroats and criminals, so this doesn't really line up either. 
Of course, there are direct consequences for this in the form of Admiral Noble clobbering Jarl Bulgraf's head in with a stick and his wife being cut in half by totally not a lightsaber. He tells Gunner that he will return in ten weeks. Tell me, partner, when I can expect my harvest. Nine, nine weeks. In ten weeks I shall return, and you shall have my ten thousand bushels prepared for my ship. We will starve to death. I, I don't understand what you want. I want everything. EVERYTHING! This switcheroo with Admiral Noble, having him appear to be a polite and cordial gentleman, only to then flip and become a murderous psychopath, is, obviously, a storytelling tool utilized in the service of drama. And there are many scenes where similar characters act in a similar way, resulting in an extremely effective build and release of tension. For an example of this, look no further than the opening scene of Inglorious Bastards. A German soldier conducts a search of a house suspected of hiding Jews. He looks everywhere he would hide. We are introduced to the character of Hans Lander with the contextual knowledge that he is not a nice person. He is an SS officer in Nazi-occupied France, and we learn shortly into the conversation that he is known as the Jew Hunter, and that his reason for visiting Monsieur Lapidite's farm is that he is looking for a Jewish family. He politely converses with Monsieur Lapidite with the goal of manipulating him into confessing where the Jews are hiding. Lander has a very clear reason for behaving in the way that he does, and the moment where he drops his act and directly states, You're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? Is absolutely chilling. Now back to Fire Moon Part 1 A Rebel of Child, we are similarly introduced to the character of Admiral Atticus Noble with the knowledge that he is not a nice person. As if the uniform were not enough of a giveaway, this was explicitly stated in the opening monologue. He sent his most brutal commander into the outer reaches. Regardless of this fact, he conducts himself very politely with the villagers until things inevitably go sideways, which, on the face of it, is quite similar to the scene from Inglorious Bastards. Why then is one masterful when the other is a cheap trick? I'll start by asking who is Noble? He is the right hand man of Balisarius, the regent of the Imperium. He commands legions of soldiers and has the entire might of the Imperium at his disposal. To say that Noble outguns the villagers of Velt would be the understatement of the century, so now let us consider what Noble's objective is. He initially states that he is interested in a long-term agreement with the villagers, where they supply him with their surplus in exchange for triple the market value. He is being generous, and if he is not outright lying, then this is a win-win for both him and the villagers. Unfortunately, we later see that he does not care at all for the lives of the villagers, killing two and condemning the rest to starve when he returns to take 90% of their harvest. Meaning that this was always a one-time transaction. Had the villagers accepted the initial offer, there is no way in goddamn hell Noble would have paid them because he has absolutely no reason to. Not only is he holding all of the leverage, but he is also seemingly pure evil. Additionally, Noble is there to take food from the villagers that he knows they have, whereas in Inglorious Bastards, Hans Lander was looking for Jews that he thought might be there, and so a brute force approach may not have been the most optimal. In Rebel Moon, the simplest course of action would have been for Noble to seize all of their food immediately at gunpoint and then demand more by a particular date. Put another way, Zack Snyder decided to have Noble behave in a very friendly manner at the start of the scene so that he could artificially crank the tension up without putting in any effort to justify why Noble is behaving in this manner. He simply does in order to allow for maximum drama, because he is a character in a film, and because Zack Snyder decided that he wanted the dramatic payoff. After the Admiral departs, he leaves behind a small contingent of 13 men. Why he does this? I have no fucking idea. The Admiral's goal here is to acquire food. These soldiers do not assist the villagers in their acquisition of said food. They instead try to rape everyone. More on that later. I had assumed that the reason they stay here was to keep tabs on the villagers and make sure they actually fulfill the Admiral's demand, rather than running off or arming themselves or hiring some samurai or something. But as becomes clear, these soldiers have no means by which to communicate with the off-world Imperium forces. Neither does the Imperium have any means by by which to contact them. What? I'll say that again. 
The Imperium is capable of faster than light travel and of destroying planets, but is incapable of basic radio communication from surface to orbit. And we know this to be the case due to the fact that all of these soldiers die pretty soon and the Imperium does not respond at all. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, we see that they have a robot. I am JC1435 of the Mechanicus Militarium. All right, my Warhammer detector has been tingling for a while, but now it's gone into overdrive. Imperium? Balisarius? Mechanicus? Militarum? What appears to be warp travel? Ornately dressed red-robed cyborgs? Commissars? What appear to be snub-nosed lasguns and las pistols? Even this fucking flag looks a little too familiar. And come to think of it, this blurry out-of-focus statue thingy looks rather like the Imperial Aquila. Anyway, because these men are the bad guys, they harass a young girl, generally act in an unhinged manner, and shoot Anthony Botkins for no reason. One of the soldiers explains that the robots won't fight anymore. That's something in their programming. Once the king was killed, lay down their weapons and refuse to fight. But just watch. No matter what I do, he doesn't fight back. <laughs> This doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but don't worry, it feeds into a payoff that also doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Speaking of things that don't make sense, the sergeant then asks, Are you malfunctioning? No, sir. Which, I, is that not precisely what a malfunctioning robot might say in response to that question? Anyway, Sam, the girl from earlier, then has a chat with Anthony Botkins. She is a peasant farm girl who, given the previously stated extreme rarity of such robots and her isolated upbringing in a Viking village, has never seen such a robot before. Naturally, she doesn't give a shit. She doesn't mention or acknowledge how incredible this thing is when it would blow her tiny little mind. Regardless, Anthony Botkins takes this opportunity to say, Hello, allow me to tell you my backstory. Do you know the story of our slain king and his beautiful daughter, the Princess Issa? There are many ways to justify exposition, if you can even be bothered to justify it. You can have another character prompt it. You can have a character deliver it for reasons that are justified by who they are and how they generally behave. You can deliver it via voiceover narration. Or, alternatively, you can have the nice robot voiced by Anthony Hopkins say, Hey kiddo, sit tight because I have just engaged exposition dumping mode. Jesus Christ, we're only half an hour in. So the exposition dumped by Anthony Botkins is that the king had a daughter, Princess Issa. The birth of a prophesied redeemer had been foretold by someone at some point, and the robots pledged themselves to defend her before she was even born. The robots believed she would usher in a new age of peace and compassion, but she was killed alongside her parents in the fateful and unfortunate stabbing incident. Anthony Botkins says that since that day, their kindness, compassion, and joy died alongside the princess. And Sam then says, now nah, bro, you gotta have a flower hat, and then everything is okay again. And that is the end of the scene. So far, the robot character is the only interesting part of the film. The idea that there were many of these robots, that they were evidently capable of cognition, or at least simulating cognition, they collectively believed in, or were programmed to believe in, the birth of the prophesied Redeemer, and after failing to protect the Redeemer, they all succumbed to a sense of hopelessness and a lack of true purpose. The humans, their makers, perceived this as some kind of fault in their programming that prevented them from fighting, when in actuality it is more of a conscious decision to abstain due to their collective apathy. All of my speculation here is only possible because Childfire Part 1 A Moon of Rebel doesn't really do anything to nail down what actually happened prior to the events of the film. Much of this I am drawing from the infinitely more interesting Warhammer 40,000 universe, which it seems more than likely was at the very least a superficial inspiration for this film. In the Warhammer 40,000 lore, artificial intelligence was outlawed by the Imperium of Man and is generally viewed as heresy. The Imperium also lost the ability to create new technology, for reasons that I won't go into now, meaning that they are forced to rely upon older tech that cannot be updated or improved upon, and in many cases, cannot be replaced if destroyed. This fits very neatly into what little we know about the backstory of the Imperium in Child Moon Part 1 of Fire of Rebel. Maybe the Imperium similarly lost their ability to make new robots, hence their extreme rarity. Maybe the artificial general intelligence they developed hundreds if not thousands of years ago is and always has been more human than human, to borrow a quote from Blade Runner. 
Maybe the robots were created pre-programmed with the knowledge of the prophesied birth of the Redeemer, and were programmed to devote their entire existence to protecting her. And maybe, just maybe, the person who assassinated the Redeemer, who was totally not Balisarius by the way, knew of the effect this would have on the robots and this was part of his motivation in committing regicide. Quite unfortunately, none of this is in the film. We only have the content of the monologue from Anthony Botkins, which serves primarily as the setup for a payoff that will come in about three minutes' time. We then see the villagers blaming Gunner for Jarl Bulgruf's death. Den suggests that they bring in the crop as demanded by Admiral Noble, concluding that they will probably not all be left to die as long as they prove themselves useful. This might have been a reasonable conclusion if not for the fact that Admiral Noble literally just murdered their defenseless leader right in front of them before stating that he absolutely intends to take all of their food and leave them to die. We then get this very colourful line delivery. He's right. Farming. That is our skill. That we can do. That they cannot. You in full return, man. I hate women. Anyway, after Hagen says, hello, allow me to tell you your backstory, Cora decides enough is enough and she decides to leave, believing that the villagers are delusional and that all she can do is escape before the Imperium returns. Hagen tries to convince her to put together a team of freedom fighters so as to fight back when the Admiral does return, which is remarkably similar to the plot of Seven Samurai, so at the very least I guess Hagen has an excellent taste in films. Seemingly, so does Zack Snyder. The problem, however, is that where this concept made sense in Seven Samurai, it makes absolutely no sense here because Zack copied a concept from a film in which the villains are a band of 30 16th century bandits and ported it into his film in which the villains are a galaxy-spanning superpower. And everything seemed to be going so well. Anyway, Cora objects to this idea, saying that she does not want to be responsible for the people of Velt dying. Oh no, the protagonist has refused the call to adventure, the poor villagers will starve, and Cora will never come to terms with whatever mysterious trauma she is afflicted with. Luckily for us, but quite unluckily for the characters involved, 12 of the 13 Imperium soldiers left occupying the village are rapists. Everybody stop trying to have sex with each other. Which serves as the perfect opportunity for Cora to realize, actually, yeah, going to Mos Eisley and putting together a team of samurai to protect the villagers from the Astra Militarum is probably the way to go, but I am getting ahead of myself. The soldiers assault Sam, the girl from earlier, with obvious penetrative intent. This, of course, happens right when Cora is in the process of leaving, which is extremely lucky both for Cora, for Sam, and for the village as a whole. She approaches the barn with an axe, and the reason she does not get shot immediately is because, as has been established of course, all of the soldiers are rapists, and therefore they want to rape everything. Obviously this doesn't happen. Cora grabs one of their guns and effortlessly mows them all down, with the tiniest amount of help from this guy who is never seen again. The sergeant, meanwhile, is still alive and is holding a gun to Sam's head. And who could possibly show up but another character we will never see again? Before I continue, how in the goddamn dicking hell was Cora, one soldier, able to take out eleven adversaries? most of whom were armed, all of whom presumably had similar training, all of whom were men, and all of whom were far larger and stronger than her. Why in the absolute piss did the sergeant do quite literally nothing whilst his men were picked off one by one? Why are all of the soldiers here, in the barn, getting rapey rather than having even a single man standing guard elsewhere in the village? As far as I can tell, these men were left here as a garrison on Velt to keep an eye on things. But rather than keep an eye on anything, they all decided to spend their time raping the locals in the barn. The idea of soldiers taking prizes in the form of women from the lands they have conquered is, of course, nothing new, but as depicted here it comes off as absurdly comical, which is never something you want to happen outside of a comedy film when dealing with the topic of rape. Anyway, Anthony Botkins is here now, arriving precisely when he means to, neither too late nor too early. And I don't know if he responded to the sounds of fighting or the sounds of Sam screaming for help, but either way, he is ordered by the sergeant to kill both Cora and the single non-rapist soldier. Yes, yes, I know, the sergeant learned quite recently and quite thoroughly that the robots are apparently no longer capable of combat. But I mean, I guess he's out of options now because he decided to stand there and watch all of his men get soloed by one girl. Because Anthony Botkins was given a flower hat, because Sam showed him kindness, which was directly contrasted with the comically evil behavior from the soldiers, 
because she literally said that she thinks the robot's compassion and kindness lives on in him, Anthony Botkins instead shoots the sergeant and then leaves without saying a word. This functions as the payoff to something that was set up less than seven minutes prior. There were some interesting things they could have done with Anthony Botkins. Artificial intelligence is apparently rare in this universe, and this particular model of robot appears more than sentient enough to make complex decisions and its decision not to fight back is perceived by the humans as a programming quirk. Shooting the sergeant to protect Sam is confirmation that the robots are capable of forming personal connections and of knowing right from wrong. All this payoff requires is that at no other point in history was anyone nice to a robot, thus giving them a reason to fight, plus it also requires that the soldiers are sadistic turbo rapists who will also shoot the quite obviously sentient Anthony Botkins for absolutely no reason. This was the start of an interesting idea. Unfortunately, all we got was that the robot was treated like shit by an angry, unhinged psychopath, the robot then shot him, and then ran off never to be seen again. I guess this will be explored properly in Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon Part 1 A Child of Fire Special Director's Cut The Robot Edition. The villagers enter the barn, drawn by the sounds of fighting, and they realize they too are gonna have to fight. To make sure his audience understands this, Zack Snyder has Cora say, We're gonna have to fight. Fuck you! Now convinced that assembling a ragtag team of Totally Not Samurai to fight against the Totally Not Galactic Empire, Cora decides to recruit Totally Not General Titus of the Ultramarines to help. Her plan at this point is to find General Titus and also to find men for him to lead so that they can fight back against Admiral Noble when he returns in 10 weeks' time. There are many holes in this plan, but I'll get to those as they pop up later. She decides to travel to Providence, aided by Gunner, who has a contact with the rebel insurgents to whom he had sold their surplus previously. This bit does actually line up. Cora wants to go to Providence, as this is how she can find the rebels. She asks Gunner to come with her as he knows how to find the rebels. And Gunner agrees because he wants Cora to boof his third leg. Anyway, shortly after they leave, Gunner says, Hello, please tell me your backstory. To which Cora responds, Well, since you asked so nicely, sit tight, pucker up, and hold on to your hat, kiddo. I will give you the short version before explaining why none of this works. When Cora was nine, the Imperium invaded her world and, true to form, destroyed everything. The army was commanded by Balisarius, who decided to spare Cora and raise her himself after killing her family. Balisarius approaches Cora and holds her gun at his head, cocks it, and lets her pull the trigger. I think what we are supposed to read from this is that he was impressed that Cora, a child, was willing to shoot him. Which is slightly confusing given that she is entirely motivated to do so as he is the man who murdered her family. I don't really know what else to say about this interaction, but I guess there are a few possibilities for why he did this. Maybe Balisarius is just a crazy person who wants to die. Maybe he somehow knew the gun wasn't going to go off and he was testing her for some reason. Maybe he discreetly pressed the safety button without her realizing. I honestly have no idea, and whilst there are a few interesting possibilities, the movie gives us nothing to work with, and so we can't actually draw anything meaningful out of the character. I can only say, well, maybe this or maybe that, and because neither Cora nor Balisarius are anything close to interesting, developed, complex, or compelling, this kind of speculation is similarly uninteresting and unproductive. Anyway, she was trained, educated, and indoctrinated in the ways of the Motherworld for five years, and she became Balisarius's protege and adoptive daughter. We get nothing further as to the relationship between Cora and Balisarius, so we don't really know if she was always trying to escape or if she decided actually the Imperium isn't too bad. I… we just have no idea. Anyway, she became an officer at age 18, and then at some point afterwards, and for some reason, she deserted and crash-landed on Velt. So far, the writers have drip-fed information to the audience with the presumed goal of building the character of Cora. When we first meet her, she is a mystery. We have a bunch of questions that the writers need to answer. And the ways in which the writers reveal information to us will affect how we view and understand the character of Cora throughout her story. A recent example of a film that expertly uncovers a mystery by slowly revealing information about its characters is The Menu, which I will not discuss here but would highly recommend. 
Anyway, the first thing we learned about Cora was that she had only been in Velt for a short amount of time, and then that she has some kind of experience of war. We then see her panic upon seeing the Motherworld ship, a moment that would have been effective if not for the surrounding context. We are told that she was found by Hagen in a crashed ship, and before she left on her quest, she was given her gun by Hagen that he had taken from the crash site and kept secret. The gun itself is very ornate, but looks to be of similar design to the weapons used by the Imperium soldiers, which, of course, begs the question as to why Korra has this weapon. We also, of course, saw that she was absurdly skilled in martial combat and at using firearms, and then we get the cosmic exposition dump from this scene. In conclusion, then, at the 47 minute mark, what have we learned about Korra as a character? Virtually nothing. All of this information is in the form of motifs. None of it is substantive character information. We do not gradually learn about who Cora is as a person, or who she used to be, how her values changed, or what caused them to change. All we learn is that she was a soldier, and that she isn't anymore. Pretty pathetic, huh? I fought for the king of distant worlds under the banner of a people who murdered my entire family. And yet we never understand why. Because Cora is not a character. Cora is a half-formed idea. Cora is where you start when creating a character. She has a backstory, and that backstory has the potential to be somewhat compelling, but she doesn't have any kind of personality or development, nor does she have any notable characterization. And, just for reference, at the 47 minute mark in A New Hope, Luke and Obi-Wan are about to meet Han Solo in the cantina. Speaking of cantinas, Cora and Gunner arrive at Mos Eisley, sorry, I mean Providence, and they witness a man getting grabbed by a grabby robot chair. In a devilishly comedic twist of inconvenience, it turns out that this man was Gunner's contact, and as we will see later, he is being captured by bounty hunters to be taken to Admiral Noble. Oh well, I guess that's that, mission over. Except that, luckily, when meeting with the highly secretive and paranoid Blood Axes to sell them food previously, the Blood Axes not only told Gunner what planet they were hiding on, but also the name of the king who was protecting them. Look, you obviously don't know anything about intelligence. Holy goddamn, well it sure is a good thing the Blood Axes are retarded so as to allow the plot to happen. Why the fuck did the Blood Axes tell Gunner where they were hiding after meeting him for the first time? This sets an expectation that the Blood Axes are not the smartest of individuals, which is thoroughly reinforced later when we meet them. However, the idea that characters this incompetent could evade the Imperium for any length of time is comical. Anyway, Korra's plan has now changed, I think. They want to travel to Sharan to recruit the Blood Axes, and also somehow locate General Titus so that he can lead the Blood Axes against the Imperium. Meaning that Korra and Gunner need a way to get off world, and they also need to find a way to track down General Titus. Luckily, the answers to both of these problems are inside of the building that is directly in front of them. They enter the cantina and begin openly discussing how they are going to find the Blood Axes and General Titus. Our best chance to find the Blood Axes is to contact the Leviticans. It might expose us. They do this without seeming to care who is listening, and they do this with the explicit knowledge that bounty hunters who work for the Imperium apprehended Gunner's contact at this location moments ago. To call you stupid would be an insult to stupid people! One would think they might be able to put two and two together and deduce that obviously this location is compromised because the Imperium has now captured Gunner's contact, which will lead to them locating the Blood Axes, but the characters in this film seem tragically bereft not only of personalities, but also of functioning thinky parts. Cora and Gunner are not secretive whatsoever about their intentions. This is a problem, firstly, because it depicts the characters as idiots, and secondly, because it damages the world building. This kind of behavior suggests that the Imperium is not an ever-present antagonistic force that is oppressing people across the galaxy, which contradicts what we are repeatedly told elsewhere in the film. And I'm not even speculating here. Cora goes on to ask the entire cantina, has anyone here heard of General Titus? Where oh where have I seen this before? Anybody know of any terrorist attacks coming up soon? 
Luckily, instead of being immediately accosted by bounty hunters, mercenaries, grabby robot chairs, or worse, one of the patrons tells her exactly where General Titus is. Last I heard he was fighting in the Colosseum at Pollux. How staggeringly easy. Not only are the characters demonstrating that they are about as subtle as sudden onset explosive diarrhea, but they are being rewarded for behaving in this way. No detective work, no subversion, no displays of intellect, no playing one character against another, no risky deception or negotiation. Nah, that all sounds like boring stuff. Just have her walk into the hostile environment where she knows the Imperium has agents and say, hey guys, where's General Titus? And then have the tentacle man say, hello, allow me to tell you my backstory. Oh, wait, no. Hello, yeah, I know where General Titus is and I will tell you for absolutely no reason. This fucking movie, I swear to God. Anyway, Gunner then gets molested. No... Touchy. Yeah, so there is a way to write this kind of character, but as we have already seen, when Zack Snyder wants a sexually aggressive antagonist, they are simply demented psychopaths who want to rape everything. Cora, having been established as one who will not let her friends get raped, intervenes and the man leaves. He soon comes back with some friends, although this isn't specified, I am going to assume they are also turbo rapists. Cora defeats them all with ease, and then they meet a shady, opportunistic smuggler with a ship they can hire to take them to find General Titus. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. If that sounds remarkably familiar, strap in for comparison time. In A New Hope, the reason they went to the cantina was because Obi-Wan knew he could find a competent and discreet pilot. He covertly found one, agreed on a price, and they went on their way. In Part Fire 1 Rebel Child A Moon Of, Cora and Gunner went to the cantina to speak with Gunner's contact only to find him being apprehended by bounty hunters. They then spoke loudly about their intentions of fighting back against the Imperium and that they were looking for General Titus. Luckily, there was a man there who not only knew where General Titus was, but was entirely willing to divulge that information for free. Luckily, there was also a man there who not only had a ship to get off world, but was also entirely willing to help Cora for free. Because I have unfortunately seen the end of this film, I know precisely why Kai helps them. But from Cora's perspective at this point, she has no idea who Kai is. He doesn't seem to have any kind of anti-Imperium sentiments. In fact, all we know about Kai is that he is an opportunist, which suggests that he is interested in money and is entirely self-serving, much like Han Solo when we first meet him. Regardless, he agrees to help Korra, even though they explicitly cannot pay him. I could help you. I oh, understand we're just simple farmers. We have some money, but this is not the one you get rich on. Pay me what it's worth to you. And they trust him because trusting him is necessary for the plot to progress. This scene is a hilarious mess. It was the first opportunity for substantial world building. It is the first location we have seen outside of the village of Velt. It is the first step our heroes take into the larger world. And yet the world reveals itself to be broken at every turn. The fact that some random alien in the cantina knew who General Titus was, not to mention knowing exactly where he is, implies that the universe the film takes place in is absolutely tiny. Yeah man, he's just General Titus. I, I go bowling with him on weekends. He lives a few blocks away. This kind of thing annihilates any sense of scale. And although the film is extremely vague with its world building, it at least attempted to give a sense of scale in the opening monologue. Immediately after liftoff, Kai tells Korra that he needs to make a stop on another planet, Neuwadi, before they go to Pollux as originally planned. Now, if I was Korra, I would be hearing the unmistakable clanging of alarm bells ringing cacophonously, and if I was Gunner, I would be blinded by the distinctive crimson hue of the biggest red flag in the history of red flags, but I need to remind you that these characters are cognitively impaired. They know nothing about Kai. They don't know his intentions. They don't know his motivation. They don't know if he is an Imperium spy. And Kai doesn't even have to lie about who he is because they didn't even bother to fucking ask him. He says, hey guys, I overheard you saying you want to go to Pollux and fight the Imperium. I can totally help with that. And then after they got on his ship, he said, yeah, so we actually aren't going to Pollux. We're going to go somewhere else. And yet, neither of the two protagonists seem to think that anything fishy is going on. They absolutely should be suspicious of Kai. 
But because his intentions don't get revealed until the climax, the writers can't have them be suspicious of him just yet. Anyway, Kai tells them that, unrelated to his reason for going to Neiwadi, there is a man on the planet who might be worth recruiting, and they agree. Meanwhile, we see Admiral Noble aboard his ship, he plugs a thingy into himself and then he gets sucked by a tentacle monster. Cut back to the heroes who have now found their second recruit. The man, Tarak, is currently working off a debt to a rancher. If you're here to accuse me of crimes against the mother world, I'm guilty as charged. I'm no friend of the realm. I have a debt on my name and I honor my debts. We can now tick the character development box for Tarak, as he will not be receiving any more for the rest of his life. So let's move on to how they plan to recruit him. They have no money, and so they cannot buy him, which of course begs the question as to what they are even doing here, but luckily for them, the rancher likes to gamble. Unluckily for those of us who appreciate coherent storytelling, the proposed bet makes absolutely no sense and is not explored whatsoever. The rancher proposes that if Tarak can ride the hippogriff, then he is free to go. What hippogriff, you ask? This one, he's got one, he's just, yeah. There's one here. If Tarak fails to ride the hippogriff, Korra, Gunner, and Kai will all be chained up to work off Tarak's debt alongside him if he survives. Well then, that is quite the deal. I can't wait to hear what the characters have to say about this. That's the deal. No, Zach, wait, wait, I want to know what, why Kai and Gunner are willing to risk this. Can you ride him? Yeah, I can ride him. Zack, no, Zack, what do you do? Oh, okay, sorry. I guess he's gonna try, he's gonna ride the hippogriff now because that's what happens next. Almost like the writers wanted to skip the boring character stuff so they could do the avatar thing where the man learns to fly the dangerous creature in a beautiful alien landscape. Although saying that, this is not the lush detailed forests of Pandora. This is a far more realistic and mature blurry orange canyon. To be clear, Cora and Gunner have just been told about Tarak. They know nothing about him other than that he doesn't like the mother world. If Tarak fails to ride the hippogriff, they will be enslaved by this rancher, which will result in Velt being defenseless when the Imperium returns, and the villagers will all starve to death shortly afterwards. Obviously, because Korra is ridiculously good at fighting, this would not be what ends up happening should Tarak fail to ride the Hippogriff, but because none of the characters actually discuss this possibility, we have absolutely no idea about how Korra and Gunner feel about the possibility of having to fight the rancher and his men. Anyway, Korra and Gunner seem to be risking everything so that they can recruit one man. And I could maybe see them doing this for General Titus, as he has been specified as crucial to their entire plan, but Tarak is just some guy. As for why Kai goes along with this, well, I will discuss Kai's actions later when we have more context. So, Tarak flies the Hippogriff, and they are free to go. It is certainly a good thing that Tarak is evidently a deeply honorable person who will keep his word to strangers he owes no loyalty to, because he could have just jumped on the Hippogriff and flown away. Actually, hold that thought, why the fuck didn't the Hippogriff just fly away? Way of its own accord. No time for that now, it's time for the writers to forget more things. They leave near Wadi without Kai doing whatever it was that he needed to do there in the first place. His entire reason for heading to the planet to begin with, if you recall. I need to stop in New Wadi first. You know, there's a rancher there. He has a man that might just work out for you. Impressed with their recruiting of Tarak, Korra asks if Kai knows of any other samurai they can convince to help defend the village. Ideally, they need seven, but I doubt she's a quibbler. And Kai says he has a few ideas. They then travel to the mining world of Dagus to recruit this nice lady and her nice hat. Because this film was written by a man-child, this lady is called Nemesis. I hate women. And because each of the potential recruits needs an action scene, Nemesis has to rescue a child from a giant spider lady. The giant spider lady tells Nemesis, Hello, allow me to tell you my backstory. And the spider mama's backstory is that she can't have kids because the air is poison, and so she wants revenge by killing all of the kids of the human mums to make them feel the same pain. Okay, Zach, you have my attention. Wait, what do you mean, that's it? 
Zack, you fool, that was the start of an idea. That is the rough outline of a character motivation. You can't keep doing this to me, Zack. You can't keep bullet pointing ideas for characters and then pasting them into the script for your multi-million dollar movie. Anyway, a couple of things to note before we move on. Firstly, Nemesis appears to empathize with a mother's pain. And as we will learn later, we won't actually learn about this later. That is all there is to her. She lost her kids and she's got pain now. Rather more interestingly, Gunner puts himself in danger to rescue the child when it appears that Nemesis is going to lose the fight. This small moment is actually a nice piece of character work. Gunner is easily the least capable person there, and yet he is the one to risk his life to protect the child. Rather more amusingly, and definitely unintentionally however, Korra, Tarak, and Kai all stood by and watched this giant spider lady try to murder a child. The reason this happened is because it is the nemesis scene where she does uh, the fight and she saves the day. But Zack Snyder doesn't seem to understand that if you write a character as present, but not taking a particular action in a scene like this, you are still informing the audience as to what those characters value. Zack Snyder is foolishly adhering to rule number two for writing Rings of Power. If it is off screen, it does not exist. We can only conclude from this that Korra and Tarak are either tremendously cowardly or that they don't particularly care about saving children, which is obviously at odds with what we know of Korra. I guess it isn't really at odds with what we know of Tarak because we don't know anything about Tarak, but I'm going to hazard a guess that Tarak is not supposed to be a cowardly child-hating sociopath. So far, the heroes have recruited two fighters to their cause, and during these scenes we learned embarrassingly little. In the Tarak scene, we learned a minuscule amount about him when the entire sequence was dedicated entirely to him, and we learned nothing about Korra, Gunner, or Kai. In the Nemesis scene, exactly the same thing happens. We learn a minuscule amount about Nemesis, and we learn absolutely nothing about Korra, Kai, or Tarak. If we were taking 10 minutes out each time to actually learn about and properly develop these new additions, then I could absolutely forgive the film being heavily focused on Tarak and then Nemesis. But given how little information is present in their scenes, this is honestly embarrassing. This is nothing more than cheap spectacle, and the same information would have better been conveyed in a montage. After recruiting Nemesis, in a stunning turn of events, Korra tells Gunner, Hello, allow me to tell you my backstory. The extra nugget of backstory we get this time is that she was appointed to the elite guard of the royal family, and she became the bodyguard to Princess Issa. The princess, previously described by Anthony Botkins as the prophesied redeemer, had the power to give life. The magical abilities of Princess Issa are pretty vague, often presented as more of a myth that people believe in rather than concrete fact, but given that Korra says, I saw on more than one occasion things that I couldn't explain. This would suggest that this is true, or at least it is what Korra believes to be true. Princess Issa did have magical powers and was able to resurrect things. How any of this works and what it has to do with the story, however, is a question I simply cannot answer. Korra's evident failure to protect the princess from tripping and falling on her own shears informs her apparent guilt regarding her own happiness. The two seasons I've spent here have given me happiness that I don't deserve. Which, at long last, 80 minutes into the film, gives us our first fully formed and explained character trait. Cora feels guilt at her failure to protect a young girl. She was given a very important task and she was unable to fulfill it. This may have even deeper repercussions given that Princess Issa might have been some kind of messianic figure, meaning that from Cora's perspective at least, her inadequacy may have caused the death of the savior of the universe. This is actually something with a little meat to it, however this meat is actually that weird vegan stuff that tastes like cardboard. Cora does not seem to be insecure, and she does not seem to be incompetent. She is the most capable person in this film, or at least she is supposed to be the most capable person in this film. What we would need to properly flesh this idea out would be for Cora to still be struggling with her confidence as a result of her failure. She would need to make mistakes as a result of this character flaw. And if you recall, this is almost what happened. 
If I find warriors to fight for Velt, I give the village hope. If I give them hope, they fight and surely lose. I won't have that blood on my hands. Cora refused the initial call to adventure, citing the fact that she was unwilling to get anyone else killed. Unfortunately, this facet was immediately dropped, as she of course had to kill the evil rape men, and from this point onwards, the guilt component ceased being a character flaw. It became a trademark, a t-shirt, and something entirely superficial and without depth or meaning. After the brief detour in which the protagonists recruited Harry Potter and Kylo Ren with Jubblies, they have finally arrived on Pollux, which, I would forgive you for not remembering, is where this guy in the cantina said that he thought General Titus was. Pollux is ancient Rome, complete with a Colosseum, the one difference between Pollux and ancient Rome being that everything here looks like ass because this is a Zack Snyder film. Anyway, they find General Titus fighting as a gladiator, and, naturally, he is played by Jimon Hounsou, who played a gladiator in Gladiator. Because this is a Zack Snyder film, and he is evidently incapable of writing a dialogue sequence involving more than two characters, Korra has a chat with General Titus, whilst Gunner, Kai, Tarak, and Nemesis chill on the sidelines. Korra says, Hello, General Titus, I am just gagging to know all about your backstory. And General Titus responds, Well, pucker up, Missy, because I, like everyone in this universe, have lived my entire life just waiting for the opportunity to tell people my backstory. In the interest of brevity, the quick version is that General Titus fought against the Imperium, his men were slaughtered after he surrendered, and he feels guilty about the whole thing and wants to be left to die in the arena. Cora then convinces him to help anyway because she too knows how to spell the word guilt and the word revenge. And I want to note that her recruiting General Titus is something of a break from the norm. Tarak agreed to help because he doesn't like the Imperium and joining Cora was preferable to being a slave. Nemesis agreed to help because, well, she doesn't ever actually agree to help. She never acknowledges the idea of helping them. We have absolutely no idea what she thinks about this, we simply cut to the next scene and she's helping them, because script's gonna script and plot's gonna plot. General Titus, conversely, declines to help them before Cora convinces him, appealing to his desire for revenge against the Imperium, for killing his soldiers. This is a clear character motivation, as simple as it may be, and it is informed directly by his guilt. His men trusted him. They bit off more than they could chew, he failed them, they were slaughtered by the Imperium, and now he has been given the opportunity to avenge them. Importantly, Korra does not have an army. Korra has an accountant, a ninja, a douchebag, and Jake Sully, so more than likely Titus will die. But at least he will die in the fight against the Imperium. This is utter shit, but at least it's something. We then cut back to Admiral Noble, who has finished playing Hide the Octopus. He meets with the bounty hunters who captured Gunner's contact with the grabby robot chair, and asks where the blood axes are. You let me go if I tell you what I know. I'll set you free, you have my word. Oh fucking hell, not this again. I wonder what will happen next. They were on Sharad. Thought we had a deal! You're free. Well, that was predictable. Okay, so I need to talk about the grabby robot chair because they're gonna pop up again very soon and I wanna get this out the way. The grabby robot chair works in a very specific way that just so happens to allow the plot to happen, but makes absolutely no sense as soon as you start asking questions. It has a hole in the back which allows the captor to use a thingy to sever the spinal cord of the captee so as to paralyze them, and then once paralyzed, the chair releases the captee and they fall face first into the floor. There is no speculation here. That is how it works. Why in God's name does it work like this? The robot seems to have been designed very specifically so that you can easily subdue someone, sever their spinal cord, and then drop them headfirst onto the floor should you ever feel the need to do that to someone. Why does the chair release the prisoner automatically once they have been paralyzed? I have absolutely no idea, but if it didn't work like this, then the third act of this film ends rather abruptly, as we will get to soon. Additionally, the fact that the robot works like this means the captors now have a vegetable person they will need to pick up and move elsewhere, presumably to dispose of, as he is now useless to them. Would it not have made sense either for Noble to just shoot the prisoner, or tell the robot to yeet him out of the airlock into space? Well, maybe but the grabby robot chair just grabs and lets go when you paralyze them, so it can't really do anything else. That's just the way it works. Shut up. It's cool, alright? 
And finally, the idea of paralyzing a prisoner for ease of transportation would make an amount of sense if it was a paralytic in the form of a drug or other temporary agent, but the grabby robot chair, for some reason, is evidently designed specifically to permanently paralyze someone by severing their spinal cord. Right, cut back to our heroes who have just landed on Sharan, home of King Levitica and approximately eight other people, and is also the location where the blood axes are hiding. They speak to the king and wait for an audience with the Blood Axes. Shortly afterwards, they are granted one, whereupon the Blood Axe siblings ask why Gunner has contacted them. I was assuming we had a level of trust. We bought your grain. Do not confuse your business of commerce with our business of revolution. I understand. Well, I fucking don't. The fact that you bought grain from him to feed your revolutionaries does not counter what Gunner just said. God damn it, this is just like Rings of Power all over again. People don't speak like this. The characters are just talking past each other without actually responding to what the other one is saying. And yet the conversation continues because both parties seem to be on the same page when they absolutely should not be. Anyway, then things get even more special. Your coming here is a great risk to us all, but we are no longer in need of your grain. Yeah, so on that topic, the Blood Axes seem to think Gunner has traveled here to sell them more grain. So they tell him they no longer need grain and that he needs to leave. This would maybe make an amount of sense if not for the fact that all, or if not all, then at the very least a substantial portion of the Blood Axes decided to fly here in their spaceships to meet them, thus leaving wherever their hiding spot was and falling into whatever kind of trap they reasonably suspected this could be. If you are Devra Bloodaxe and you hear that this goofy farm accountant you met that one time has arrived on the doorstep of your secret hideout, accompanied by a troop of underdeveloped clown ideas masquerading as characters, you send three or four of your men out to tell them to piss off. Or you do nothing and hope they give up, believing they are in the wrong place. What you absolutely do not fucking do is personally go out there and meet him and also bring your army with you via a fleet of spaceships to say hello. If anyone is watching this remotely, you have just revealed your location- Oh, wait, no, sorry. I keep assuming that the Imperium has this kind of technology when they explicitly do not, because if they did, then Velt would currently be a crater. Anyway, I have to rewind slightly because we have just received a magnum opus of retardedness in a very short amount of time. Devra Bloodaxe states that King Levitica was able to sustain them with kindness which, if we run through the talk like a normal fucking person translator, means King Levitica has enough food to not only feed the eight other people who live on this planet, but also to feed the Blood Axe army. A few questions, if you don't mind. If King Levitica has enough food to feed what has been explicitly referred to multiple times as an army, then why were the Blood Axes buying food from Gunner in the first place? If King Levitica has enough food to feed an army, then why did Admiral Noble travel to a goddamn farm in the middle of bumfuck nowhere to extort medieval peasants for their food instead of coming to Sharan and extorting King Levitica? Especially given that, as we learn later, King Levitica's people have a moral code to help those in need. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Did Admiral Noble not know about the excess food on Sharan? Plausibly, but then why did he know about the excess food on Velt? Additionally, the reason why he didn't travel to Sharan initially cannot be that King Levitica is a king and that therefore extorting, threatening, or killing him would have political repercussions because, spoiler alert, the next scene involves Admiral Noble pounding some calamari. And to answer all of these rhetorical questions with one simple answer, the reason none of this happens is because then there would be no story. Oh no. Anyway, Cora explains the situation and says with the Blood Axe men and ships, they could mount a real defense against the Imperium. With you, we could mount a real defense. And of course, we can pay you with the surplus from our harvest. Shut the fuck up! They already said they don't need your food. Anyway, Devra Blood Axe explains that the King's gaze cannot be destroyed by their fighters, and that it is a world destroyer. I have no idea how she knows the name of the ship, as all she was told was that a dreadnought is threatening the village. Anyway, Cora appeals to the Blood Axes by saying that Gunner's people worked hard to grow the grain they bought from him. 
and that this is the reason why Admiral Noble arrived in the village in the first place. No. Nope. That is not what happened. Admiral Noble arrived because he was trying to locate and exterminate the Blood Axes, and he needed food because the Blood Axes had destroyed a bunch of their trading ports. The prior transaction between Gunner and the Blood Axes has absolutely no bearing on the current predicament in Velt. If Gunner had sold the surplus to someone else, the Blood Axes would still be here, Admiral Noble would have still arrived in Velt, and the rest of the film would have played out in exactly the same way. But random, maybe Cora knows that this doesn't make sense and she's lying to get the blood axes on her side. Get out of here, retarded alter ego. Watching films like this is not going to cure you of your affliction. No, that doesn't make sense either because neither of the blood axe siblings point this out. They accept that buying food from Gunner caused the Imperium to take an interest in Velt when they would have absolutely no reason to think this. Anyway, if we eject the parts that don't make a lick of sense, which is about 98% of it, what is happening here from a character perspective is that Korra is appealing to the Blood Axes by saying that they are partly responsible for the villagers of Velt being forced to deal with a world-destroying Dreadnought. Incredibly, this works, and Darien Blood Axe agrees to go with them. Actually, yeah, this shouldn't be at all surprising, as the Blood Axes have already demonstrated their supreme lack of intelligence on multiple occasions. Speaking of the Blood Axes and their supreme lack of intelligence, we then get this fascinating conversation. We cannot fight in the open against the King's Gate. If the farmer found us, it won't be long before Noble does. Here, Devra tells Darian that she doesn't want to launch themselves into a suicide mission against the King's Gaze, which is fair enough. Darian counters by saying that their hiding spot on Sharan is clearly compromised as Gunner was able to find them and that therefore Admiral Noble will not be far behind. Which is also fair enough, although it highlights the rather spectacular convenience that Korra managed to arrive before Noble despite her making multiple stops at other planets along the way. Shockingly, we have just had two characters explain their perspectives to each other in a coherent manner that is consistent with the information they each have at this particular time. What the hell is going on? That doesn't last long, however, as we then have what is possibly the dumbest line in the whole fucking movie. And I will not allow another world to fall in our name. What is clearly intended by this line is that Darian doesn't want innocents to die in service of his revolution, which is why he wants to defend the villagers of Velt. What is hilariously unintended by this line is that by travelling to Velt to make sure it doesn't fall in the name of the Blood Axe Rebellion, he has left the planet of Sharan undefended, and King Levitica entirely vulnerable to the impending threat posed by the imminent arrival of Admiral Noble, a threat that Darian himself acknowledged five seconds earlier. If the farmer found us, it won't be long before Noble does. Or, in other words, Darian Bloodaxe allows another innocent world to fall in his name by choosing to try to prevent a different innocent world from falling in his name. What are you, retarded? One would think he would be more inclined to protect his generous host, King Levitica, than a bunch of farmers he has never met, but one would of course have to be paying attention to this glorious train wreck, which is a burden I bear so you don't have to. We then get Darian Bloodaxe's motivational speech to his rebels. Because Darian is a fascinating moron, the speech is an exquisite piece of word salad that vaguely points in the direction of meaning something, but simply sounds like the first draft of a script written by a ten-year-old who would rather be licking windows. Thanks to the aggressive, overzealous, and trigger-happy nature of YouTube's copyright system, I can't play the whole speech for you, so I will read it instead. These people, they've come to us with nowhere else to turn. They come seeking our help to stand against a dreadnought of the mother world. Is that not what we stand for? Are they not who we once were? If we will not stand with these defiant farmers to protect their home, then the revolution is meaningless. Under free will, who among you is willing to die for what we believe rather than hide behind it? Oh, I want to make fun of you for saying that, but I kind of know what you mean. In this speech, Darian suggests that the Blood Axes stand for standing against a dreadnought of the Mother World, which is an unbelievably clunky way to say that the Blood Axes stand against the Mother World. To stand against a dreadnought of the Mother World. Is that not what we stand for? And he also suggests that the rebels present who are not willing to die for what they believe are instead hiding behind what they believe. Who among you is willing to die for what we believe? 
rather than hide behind it. Or, in other words, he says, who among you is willing to die for the rebellion rather than hide behind the rebellion? Which is simply a nonsense statement that doesn't require any untangling. It simply means nothing. Anyway, he then hugs his sister and says, Thank Levitica and leave this planet. But, but you just said that you know Admiral Noble is coming hit you- fuck it, let's just keep going. Then we get some characterization for Kai, because he has done absolutely nothing since his opening scene approximately 30 minutes ago, and something is totally not about to happen involving his character. Why would he agree to help you? Flodax? Just seems short-sighted. I mean, yeah, but not for the reason the writers think. The writers, and Kai, think that Darian Bloodaxe is being over-eager and suicidal in his heroic battle to protect the innocent, whereas, in actuality, Darian Bloodaxe is being retarded by allowing one planet to die so that he can save another without realizing. Anyway, Korra responds, Guilt. It's a powerful thing. Suggesting that Darian Bloodaxe is motivated by guilt. Just like her, and just like General Titus. And so, the faintest hint of a thematic throughline is established. The character work in this film is utterly, vanishingly minuscule. But I am more than happy to agree that Korra and General Titus are somewhat driven by feelings of guilt. Conversely, we have received absolutely no such characterization for Darian Bloodaxe. We have, in fact, received no characterization for Darian Bloodaxe. Which I guess means that Korra is either projecting or is simply guessing at what might be motivating him. Kai then explains that he would like to move on from his questionable past, and that Korra has inspired him to pursue more honorable goals, such as defending the innocent villagers of Velt. Setting aside the fact that Korra and Kai have not spoken to each other since he convinced her to recruit Tarak, this is the second, or third, I've lost count, piece of character development in Of Fire Rebel One Child Moon Part Er, and it comes just in time for the climax of the film, which we will get to soon. Kai tells Korra that if he is going to join them in a likely suicidal fight against the Dreadnought, he wants to first make a stop in Gondavol because he has cargo for some buyers who are not known for their patience. This doesn't make any sense, because if Kai dies, which is absolutely expected, then his debts are settled anyway. But unfortunately, the third act of the film requires that Korra accept this without engaging her brain, and she agrees to stop in Gondival. Meanwhile, Admiral Noble turns King Levitica into fish pie. Thank you again to the Blood Axes for explicitly stating that this would happen, but then forgetting moments later. I hate you. The King's Gaze then begins annihilating the planet from orbit. For some strange reason, the gunners are cleared to engage whilst Admiral Noble is still on the planet, but shut the fuck up, it looks so goddamn cool, it doesn't have to make sense. I also have no idea how they can be cleared to engage, as we have already seen multiple times, the Imperium do not have any means by which to communicate with or monitor a planet whilst in orbit, which means they have no means by which to know if their leader is still on the planet, which means they decided, fuck it, let's just start blasting, rather than waiting for him to return to the ship. They are not in any particular hurry, there is no reason to destroy Sharan as soon as humanly possible, they are simply idiots who do what the script says because look at how fucking cool this shot is. Yay! Also, if you recall, Sharan has lots of food. King Levitica's kindness has been more than enough to sustain us. King Levitica was able to feed his citizens and the Blood Axe army. Admiral Noble could have demanded the food stockpiles from King Levitica and then just left. Instead, the Imperium are now blowing everything up because evil and stupid go hand in hand in this film. Actually, I guess everything and stupid go hand in hand in this film. Anyway, the heroes land on Gondival so that Kai can settle his debts before embarking on a suicide mission. Then, in a shocking twist, Kai betrays everyone. The cargo turns out to be those grabby robot chairs, which grab Korra, Darian Bloodaxe, Nemesis, and Titus. Gunner is not grabbed because Kai didn't bring enough chairs, and because Gunner needs to be given the opportunity to save the day, so saith the writers. Kai reveals to Korra that he planned this from the start. He wanted to use the fact that she was planning a resistance to round up a couple of heads so that he could turn them all in collectively. He also reveals that he knows Korra's true history, that she is Arthelaeus, the biggest prize of them all. Before we continue, I need to take a look at Kai's evil plan now that it has been revealed in full, and don't worry, this won't take long because there is very little to it. When we first meet Kai, he describes himself as an opportunist. So you're a gun for hire? No, that's not my thing. I'm more of an 
opportunist, you might say. He planned from the start to go along with Cora and Gunner's idealistic hunt for soldiers to protect the village, and he wanted them to succeed in assembling a superhero team of big dick outlaws so that he could round them all up in one go and collect a mother load of a bounty. How then did Kai facilitate this? Well, luckily for him, Cora is an idiot, as he learned of Cora's intentions after she straight up told him, despite her not knowing who he is. We're searching for soldiers for a fight against the mother world. Kai then went out of his way to suggest that they pick up Tarak, knowing that Tarak would come willingly if given the chance to fight the Imperium. Of course, the chosen method by which to recruit Tarak also meant Kai risked being imprisoned for years, but yeah, that's just, you know, it's, it's just character stuff. Kai is also the reason they went to recruit Nemesis, and we don't actually know why Nemesis agreed to help, but it's just, it's just a bit of script stuff, you know? Kai had nothing to do with locating or acquiring General Titus or Darien Bloodaxe, but he knew when he met Korra that she supposedly knew where to find them. Korra's original plan was to find General Titus and then find the Blood Axes, so that General Titus could lead the Blood Axes. Because of Kai's pit stops, the heroes go to pick up Tarak and Nemesis first, when one would think that surely it would make more sense to recruit General Titus first. Everyone seems to know who he is, and having him on your team could be used to attract others. Getting him on board first would have benefited Korra on her quest, and it would have benefited Kai, who planned to betray them. At some point later, and by some unknown means, Kai then worked out that Korra is actually Arthelaus, and is the most wanted fugitive in the known universe. But why? Although he was clearly in communication with Admiral Noble, which according to this film isn't possible, but anyway, it can't be that Noble told Kai who Korra really is because Noble didn't seem to know either. Anyway, given that both Tarak and Nemesis came entirely willingly, Kai could easily have feigned the whole rebellion thing and captured them himself without relying on Korra. Given that these grabby robot chairs appear to be an easy way to subdue someone indefinitely, Kai could easily have subdued Korra the moment he realized she was Arthelaus. His plan is also incredibly risky for someone claiming to be an opportunist, as if they get caught before he has chance to betray them, he is just as fucked as they are. Kai is actively working with rebels in the name of rebellion. He isn't working undercover and he doesn't have a way out should they be captured. Kai could have feigned support for the Rebellion and his distaste for the Motherworld from the start, only to later reveal that actually he did it all for the cash. What we got instead was that he was set up from the start to be someone who only cares about money and doesn't give a shit about the Rebellion. And the big reveal is that he only cares about money and doesn't give a shit about the Rebellion. No character questions why he would help them in the first place given that they can't afford to pay him, and eventually when he betrays them, they are all shocked that he did this entirely for the money, as if this was not his one single defining character trait. Rather than build Kai as a character, he was introduced as a plot device, he did nothing for 40 minutes, and was then given a token piece of characterization before betraying everyone. His actions are extremely questionable, his plan is incredibly risky, he learns things off screen because the script says so, and his plan relies on both himself and all other characters involved having the critical thinking skills of a disabled jellyfish. Anyway, on with the plot. Admiral Noble arrives and says, hello, allow me to tell you all your backstories. And he proceeds to tell the audience about Darien Bloodaxe, Tarak, who as it turns out is a prince, which I guess Zack considers character development, General Titus, and Nemesis. He then approaches Korra and takes her gun. Given how much emphasis is put on this gun, I think it is pretty clear that what is happening here is that Admiral Noble recognizes this gun as either being the gun that belonged to Arthelaus or being the gun used by all of the Royal Guard, which would still lead him to conclude that Cora is Arthelaus. If this is the case, then it plugs one hole and tears open a brand new one. If the gun is something that can identify Cora as Arthelaus, then this is a potential explanation as to how Kai realized who she really was. He could very plausibly have noticed her obviously ornate weapon, taken a closer look, realized what it was, contacted Admiral Noble, and added her to the list of people to turn over to the Imperium. The problem with this is that it destroys any level of intelligence that Korra had, even by the most charitable of standards. 
Cora has been walking around with a gun that can identify her as the most wanted person in the universe this entire time. She has taken no care to hide it or refrain from using it. When she was given the gun by Hagen, she should have buried the fucking thing. If this gun can identify Cora as Arthelaus, which certainly seems to be the case, then Cora keeping it makes her an imbecile of the most cosmic of proportions. Anyway, Admiral Noble wants to take them all to Balisarius and become a hero of the Imperium. Kai seems to want Gunner to get out of this alive, and I don't really have any idea why, because neither character has spoken to each other since their first scene. He tells Gunner to paralyze Korra for transportation, and then this happens. So sorry. You can do it. Gunner, of course, decides not to paralyze Cora. He instead removes the paralyzer gun from the back of the grabby robot chair, and this action of course makes the chair release Cora, because as seen earlier, this is what the grabby robot chair does. Luckily for both Gunner and Cora, this is precisely how it works. And Gunner knows this is how it works, despite him being a farmer with no real understanding of or experience with robots, and this then allows for Gunner to kill Kai and release Cora simultaneously before anyone can can react. What is happening? The only reason they aren't all killed is that Kai decides to give the paralyzer gun to Gunner so that he can personally be the one to paralyze Korra. I have no idea why he does this. This also requires that Admiral Noble allows this to happen. I have no idea why he does this. Also, are the chairs one use only? Are they specifically programmed to grab certain people? I think we have to assume that yes they are, which means the chair should immediately grab Cora again as she is quite obviously still a threat. But the grabby robot chair part of the film is over and it's time for the action scene. No one has any more grabby robot chairs to use because that would of course end the fight in seconds, given how effective they seem to be. Now that Cora is free, the fighting begins. She manages to survive whilst surrounded by multiple armed opponents who for some reason don't shoot her when she stops to do her trailer pose. If any of you were unaware of what plot armor is, this. This is plot armor. She fights for a good minute or two against the Imperium forces before Gunner frees the other fighters, none of whom get shot either before or after they are freed and none of whom sustain any damage whatsoever. To be completely fair though, Admiral Noble also doesn't get shot whilst standing in an open firing line and whilst wearing absolutely no armor of any kind, so I guess the powers of plot armor work both ways. Maybe everyone is just shit? Well, no, we've already seen how good Korra is at fighting and shooting things, and unless we're supposed to accept that the Imperium doesn't train their soldiers except for the ones that join the Royal Guard, all of the people involved in this fight, as well as the fight in the barn earlier, should be displaying somewhat similar levels of fighting ability. Anyway, Darian Bloodaxe decides to take his earlier motivational speech entirely literally. To stand against a dreadnought of the mother world. Is that not what we stand for? And so he decides to stand against the Dreadnought. Because the pilot forgets that ranged weapons can be used at range, it is hovering right next to a conveniently placed crane, which allows Darian Bloodaxe to take out the gunner. Although Bloodaxe also dies in the attempt. Yes, you saw that correctly. The intergalactic planet-destroying ship has windows that can be pierced by a sharp stick. As he dies, however, he manages to hit a joystick, which causes the King's Gaze to crash. This also means that this dude wasn't the gunner, he was the pilot. He was the one single guy piloting this thing. Remember how Star Destroyers had entire crews of navigators, gunners, and pilots? Well, one Rebel of Child Moon a fire part is a more mature take on Star Wars, you see. This is like Star Wars, but for adults. Which is why everything seems to have been designed and written by a seven-year-old with ADHD. Speaking of... Wait, who the fuck is this person? I know nothing about her. She has had one line of dialogue? Actually, shit, that doesn't narrow it down. This character is a random rebel soldier, and she is being given a chance to re for the world to see. 
I guess someone has to react to Darian Bloodaxe's death, and this character is the only one who has actually spoken to him before, so I suppose I understand the decision. This actress is clearly giving it her all, and honestly, I think part of the reason this is so fucking funny is because of how out of place it feels. The main problem is not that the actress looks really awkward and strange making this absurd face, although that is certainly part of it. If we understood the relationship this character had with Darian Bloodaxe, what he meant to her, or why she joined his rebellion, then this kind of reaction to his death would be absolutely justified. Maybe just don't unhinge your jaw quite so much next time. What we got instead was that a character we know nothing about died, and then another character we know nothing about reacted to it in a way that implies that something very meaningful and emotional has just happened. Speaking of meaningful and emotional things happening, Cora charges towards Admiral Noble so they can have their boss fight, and they are conveniently separated from the rest of the fighting by the crashed ship. They fight, she wins. Meanwhile, Gunner, Tarak, Nemesis, General Titus, and Rhee have managed to defeat all of the bounty hunters and Imperium forces. They accomplish this via the means of it taking place off-screen. Rhee says that she should have died alongside her leader, and Tarak responds, I know a thing or two about guilt of carrying on when those you sworn to fight with are gone. Which has come out of fucking nowhere because we know nothing about Tarak. I guess one of the central themes of Moon are of Fire One Child Part Rebel is that every character is dealing with some form of guilt, and we are meant to see the various ways in which they handle this. Unfortunately for Zack Snyder, simply having a couple of characters say, hello, I am guilty, is insufficient to establish or explore this theme. The survivors then take Kai's ship, which of course not only survived the battle, but also sustained no notable damage and remained entirely flightworthy, and return to Velt. They ask Korra if she is indeed Arthur Laius, and she retorts that Kai was a liar and declines to answer the question. I don't really know or care if they believe her, because whether she is Korra, the girl from Velt who fought back against her oppressors, or if she is Arthur Laius, the ex-Imperium soldier who defected, hid on Velt, and then fought back against her oppressors, doesn't actually change anything. I guess they could just look at her gun, but anyway. My guess as to what will happen next is that the Imperium will realize what happened and will return in force to exterminatus the living shit out of Velt, and with both Korra and General Titus being ex-Imperium military, they should absolutely also expect some kind of retaliation. Maybe they do, and maybe they are going to evacuate the village and regroup with the other blood axes to prepare. But given that none of them even acknowledge the fact that the Imperium is still a threat, and given that this scene is extremely optimistic and is very much presented as a happy ending, my guess is that either the writers forgot, or they wanted to mislead the audience to prepare for part two. As they ride off into the sunset, we see that Anthony Botkins has stuck around, and he now has horns and a spear. And I'm not even going to attempt to speculate as to what the fuck this is supposed to mean, because the writers haven't given me anything to go on. No, Zack, giving the robot horns is not character development. Admiral Noble sustained some pretty substantial injuries, but this being science fiction, I don't really have any fundamental problem with the idea of him being recoverable. I do, however, have a rather substantial problem with the way in which he is recovered. So, his body is lying on a rock in the middle of what appears to be an ocean, which is incredibly lucky, as had this rock not been there, then his corpse would have been lost in the depths. A ship flies down, picks him up, and flies him back to a larger ship in orbit. The totally not Adeptus Mechanicus tech priests order that Noble be prepared for transmission, and that Balisarius is standing by. They plug his body into a thingy, pump him full of stuff, and zap him into some kind of holodeck dreamscape so he can have a chat with Balisarius. Noble tells his master that he has found Arthur Laius, and that she has teamed up with a bunch of other wanted revolutionaries. Balisarius goes on to tell us that Cora is super competent and dangerous. My daughter, Arthur Laius. One of the most dangerous and decorated warriors in the history of armed conflict. And that General Titus is a genius. That she's joined forces with the genius. Battlefield Commander General Titus. And honestly, this is rather fitting. This is a crystallization of how this entire film has communicated character information to the audience. We don't learn about them through their actions, we are instead told through dialogue that they are really strong or really smart. Pretty pathetic, huh? Balisarius then orders that Noble will crush the insurgents and capture Korra alive so that he can make an example of her. Which I guess is supposed to motivate Admiral Noble in the next film. Anyway, the conversation ends and Noble is booted out of the holodeck and back into reality. Did he make it back? I don't know. 
I have no heartbeat or brain function. After being ejected, Noble has no heartbeat and no brain activity. There are two possible reasons for this, and neither of them make any sense. Option 1. Noble was physically and mentally deceased when he was plugged in. The holodeck somehow allowed his brain to communicate with Balisarius even though he is dead, and now that he has been ejected, his body remains deceased because he died back on Gondaval after fighting Korra. Option 2. Noble was at the brink of death when he was plugged into the holodeck. He communicated with Balisarius as he was still alive, and then the act of him being booted from the holodeck caused his heart and brain to stop, because I guess using the holodeck is pretty taxing on you physically. Option 2 makes substantially more sense, but it also requires that Noble is definitively alive when he is plugged in, which I absolutely do not accept for one fucking second. But with that, we have reached the end of the film, so now it's time to zoom out and look at some of the broader problems that are present. As you already know, Rebel Moon borrows heavily from other far, far superior films in many ways, but not all of these instances of what could generously be described as homage are equally significant. Broadly speaking, the first half of Rebel Moon is extremely similar to the first half of Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope. Luke, a farmer, is forced to leave his home after the Empire murders his aunt and uncle whilst looking for the two droids. He teams up with Obi-Wan, a mysterious warrior, to get the droids to their owner, Princess Leia, on Alderaan. Luke is harassed by a violent local in a bar and is rescued by Obi-Wan. They then hire a shady smuggler, Han Solo, to take them to Alderaan. Something very familiar about all this. In Rebel Moon, Korra, a mysterious warrior, is forced to leave her home after the Imperium murder her village leader to extort the village for food. She teams up with Gunner, a farmer, to assemble a team of fighters to defend the village. Gunner is harassed by a violent local at a bar and is rescued by Korra. They then hire a shady smuggler, Kai, to take them to General Titus. The main difference here is that the mysterious warrior is the primary protagonist in Rebel Moon, whereas in A New Hope, it is the farmer. Apart from that one change, the similarities are blatant. At around the halfway mark, however, Rebel Moon departs from Star Wars and starts borrowing more heavily from Seven Samurai. As you may well be aware, Star Wars A New Hope was itself inspired heavily by another Kurosawa film, The Hidden Fortress. But there is a world of difference between being inspired by certain ideas and crafting them into something completely new, and picking specific narrative beats and slapping them together without putting in the work required for the story to make sense. To be clear, I am not in any way claiming that Rebel Moon is bad because it steals from Star Wars and Seven Samurai. I am claiming that Rebel Moon is bad and it steals from Star Wars and Seven Samurai. Firstly, Rebel Moon combines the premises of both films and we are presented with rebels fighting against an evil empire who want to steal food from some villagers. I don't particularly care that this premise is extremely derivative, but the reason I am highlighting this is that these ideas have been combined because Zack Snyder likes them. However, no effort was put in to even try to make these concepts function simultaneously. In Seven Samurai, the impending threat that will return to the village is a group of 16th century bandits. The villagers choose to fight back because if the bandits are dealt with, then the village will be in the clear unless a different group of bandits decides to attack them, and should this occur, the villagers will be far better prepared. It therefore makes sense for the villagers to hire samurai to fight the bandits and defend their home. In Rebel Moon, however, the impending threat that will return to the village is a planet-destroying spaceship belonging to a galaxy-spanning superpower. If the heroes are successful and the spaceship and its troops are dealt with, the village will be obliterated very shortly afterwards. A highly militaristic and oppressive spacefaring faction with access to planet-destroying technology is in no way comparable to a group of 30 bandits armed with swords and a couple of muskets. And the fact that it's like Seven Samurai doesn't make the actions of the characters in Rebel Moon suddenly make sense. Additionally, given Korra's apparent history, she would know that this doesn't make any sense. Now, onto the planet-destroying superweapon itself. In the case of Star Wars, the Death Star is the most dangerous weapon in the galaxy. It is the pride and joy of the Galactic Empire, and its destruction at the end of A New Hope is a crippling blow to them. Conversely, the King's Gaze in Rebel Moon is one of many dreadnoughts in the Imperium's fleet, and they are all capable of destroying a planet. 
In Korra's original plan, the destruction of the King's Gaze was incidental, as it was directly threatening the village. At no point was the plan to destroy the King's Gaze so as to deal a crippling blow against the Imperium, and the reason this wasn't the plan is that the Imperium is so unfathomably vast and powerful that the loss of one ship will not trouble them. Therefore, we have no reason to believe that the events of this film will result in anything other than the total annihilation of Velt, the Blood Axes, and everyone peripherally related to the destruction of the King's Gaze. All the Imperium needs to do is send three or four more of these things into that system of planets and purge some heretic scum with the blessed fire of the Emperor. Which is exactly what they would do given how Balisarius has been characterized. Maybe this will happen in part two, so this isn't a criticism of part one. However, the fact that no character seems aware of this inevitability is absolutely a criticism of part one. Those are the two most impactful instances of the writers copying and pasting without understanding the consequences of doing so, but we also have more superficial details, such as the fact that the Empire and the Imperium both dress like space Nazis, the fact that the villagers in Rebel Moon and Seven Samurai offer to pay the fighters with food because they have no money, the existence of a nearly extinct group of mysterious warriors who were sworn to protect the galaxy, the existence of a form of laser sword, the fact that both Luke and Gunner are farmers who are whisked away on a magical adventure, and the fact that the turning point for both Luke and Cora is when the antagonists murder their families, Luke's aunt and uncle, and both Cora's family in the flashback, and her village leader, who isn't related to her but he is nonetheless the father of the village. There are also multiple references to the Warhammer 40,000 universe which I have already mentioned, but most of these are either superficial details such as names and costume choices, or they relate to the back story of the Imperium which has at this point been only very casually mentioned, so I won't bother speculating here and will save this for part two if it becomes necessary. To try and explain exactly why the plot and pacing of Rebel Moon is so fucked, I have put together a plot timeline which shows where the action scenes are, as well as smaller moments of intensity or violence. It also just so happens that A New Hope has excellent pacing, as does Seven Samurai, both of which give us a good reference for how to do this properly. Alright, so here's the timeline for all three films. The first thing to note is that A New Hope and Rebel Moon are almost exactly the same length as each other, whereas Seven Samurai is substantially longer, so although the timestamps will not line up, the overall structures of the films are nonetheless directly comparable. The blue indicates moments of downtime that are used to either develop characters, explore the setting, or drive the plot, and the red indicates either full-blown action scenes or small moments of heightened intensity, such as here when Vader strangles the rebel soldier. And this black bit in Seven Samurai is the intermission. The first thing that is immediately obvious is that the action in A New Hope occurs almost entirely within the final third which includes the prison break, the trash compactor, the duel with Vader, the TIE fighter battle, and the attack on the Death Star. The same is true of Seven Samurai, as prior to the bandits attacking the village there is very limited action. Conversely, Rebel Moon front loads a lot of its action scenes, and the final third of the film contains virtually no action, apart from the final battle which lasts for about eight and a half minutes. There is a 20 minute period right in the middle of Rebel Moon where we are bombarded by action scenes, but the plot, rather confusingly, grinds to a halt. This is something of a rarity with films as action scenes are often full of narrative developments, for better or worse, but in Rebel Moon these scenes are entirely superfluous. We have the second confrontation with the pervert, a confrontation that could have been cut and the plot would not change. We then get the unjustifiably lengthy sequence of Tarak flying a hippogriff, and a few minutes later we get the fight between Nemesis and the giant spider lady. These scenes are a problem because the story being told stops for minutes at a time so that we can indulge in overlong action scenes involving characters that do not have any kind of personality, nor do the events of the scenes themselves have anything to do with the larger narrative. This whole middle section from when they leave the planet in Kai's ship to when they meet General Titus and the Blood Axes would have been far better served as a montage as this would have allowed the film to pick up in pace rather than grind to a halt. Changing or cutting these scenes doesn't fix the film's pacing on its own however, as there are still plenty of other problems. 
There is a very long stretch with very little action in A New Hope, from when we meet Luke to when they escape Tatooine on the Millennium Falcon. This sequence lasts approximately 40 minutes, but the film never feels lethargic or self-indulgent, and there are primarily two reasons for this. One is that this stretch is punctuated by smaller moments of action and intensity. The attack from the Sand People, Luke finding the corpses of his aunt and uncle, and the confrontation in the cantina. Perhaps more importantly, however, the relatively low-intensity stretches are filled with excellent character work, world-building, and general storytelling. If these long sequences of storytelling were instead populated by nonsense world-building, uninteresting and underdeveloped characters, and an almost spiteful lack of care for how stories are told, then the film would feel slow, empty, inconsequential, and unengaging because the film would be wasting the viewer's time with bullshit. In both A New Hope and Seven Samurai, the story gets going extremely quickly. The opening titles tell us what we need to know. There is a civil war, rebels are fighting the evil empire, they stole plans to the Death Star, which is a space station that can destroy a planet, and Princess Leia is currently trying to get the Death Star plans to Alderaan. We then jump straight into the action that is directly related to the opening title crawl. We are on the ship with Leia and the Death Star plans, who the factions are is clear, and we are able to understand very quickly who wants what and why. Darth Vader is introduced very early, and we learn about him entirely through his actions, rather than by having someone explain who Darth Vader is during a five-minute flashback covering everything that happened to him 30 years prior. It takes 17 minutes for us to even meet Luke Skywalker, and yet none of this setup ever feels like it is dragging or wasting time. Similarly, in the case of Seven Samurai, the opening titles tell us that, in the 16th century during civil wars, an endless cycle of conflict left the countryside overrun by bandits. Peaceful peasants lived in terror of the thunder of approaching hooves, which is all the context you need to understand the story. We are then dropped immediately into the village as the villagers are trying to work out how to deal with the bandits, and we follow them as they convince a samurai to help them, and then go on to recruit more. Rebel Moon is about the lowest you can get in terms of a bar for character work, but it is still hilarious to me that we learn substantially more about both Luke Skywalker and Kambe in their opening scenes than we do about any character in the entire runtime of Rebel Moon. Even extremely minor characters such as Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru are substantially more understandable and coherent than similar characters in Rebel Moon such as Sindri and Hagen. In a nutshell, A New Hope and Seven Samurai are extremely tight, deliberate, efficient, and full of detailed characters that service the needs of the plot in a very natural manner. There are two similarly long stretches of low-intensity storytelling in Rebel Moon, and this, I think, is what really highlights the problem with the film's schizophrenic pacing. The first 35 minutes feel extremely slow by comparison to A New Hope in particular, and this is in part because A New Hope drops you straight into the action before slowing down to build the characters once we meet Luke. Rebel Moon, on the other hand, does not start with an action scene. Apart from these two dramatic beats, the arrival of the Dreadnought and Noble killing Sindri, the first 35 minutes is entirely devoted to character work, and setting up the conflict of the film involving Noble. And as I have already explored, the character work in Rebel Moon is shit, as is the central conflict involving Noble. And the second stretch of lower intensity storytelling stretches from just after they recruit Nemesis to Kai's betrayal on Gondival. This stretch is the latter half of the second act of the story, and serves as the build-up to the climax of Act 3. This part of a story, generally speaking, is usually where the intensity builds to its highest point, which is absolutely true of both A New Hope and Seven Samurai. By having this section of the film, in particular, be almost entirely devoid of any action, tension, or major dramatic beats, the writers have inadvertently killed any momentum the story had retained up to this point. What makes A New Hope and Seven Samurai such useful comparisons is that in spite of the substantial plot similarities, Rebel Moon is totally different in terms of pacing. This period of downtime in Rebel Moon is right when the action kicks off in A New Hope on the Death Star, and it is also right when the shit is starting to hit the fan in Seven Samurai as they head out to attack the bandits. Rebel Moon, on the other hand, packs in a heap of inconsequential side action right in the middle of its runtime, and then does nothing for half an hour before the final battle. 
I think it is also interesting to note that when looking at this timeline, A New Hope and Seven Samurai can clearly be divided into three acts. Act 1 of A New Hope covers the start through to Luke deciding to join Obi-Wan and go to Alderaan. Act 2 covers the cantina, the Death Star scenes, and culminates in Obi-Wan's death. And Act 3 covers the heroes joining up with the rest of the rebellion and taking down the Death Star. In Seven Samurai, Act 1 covers the villagers recruiting the samurai, Act 2 covers them preparing the defenses and attacking the bandit camp, and Act 3 covers them defending the village. In contrast to this, I have absolutely no fucking idea what the hell is going on with the act structure in Rebel Moon. Just to preemptively cover my own ass here, a three-act structure is not a necessity for every story. There are plenty of stories that do not conform to this basic structure. However, given that Rebel Moon is very obviously inspired by and borrows heavily from both A New Hope and Seven Samurai, two stories that adhere almost perfectly to the conventional three-act structure, I think it is absolutely fair to directly apply this template to Rebel Moon due to the similarities and point out why one of these things is not like the others. Regarding the characters, this will not take long at all because the film barely has what I would call characters. We have Korra, the mysterious ex-soldier for the Imperium who ran away after she failed to protect the princess. Gunner, the farmer who fancies Korra and doesn't care about revolution. Kai, the smuggler who betrays everyone. Admiral Atticus Noble, the evil man who wants to do evil. Tarak, the man who doesn't do anything. Nemesis, the woman who doesn't do anything. General Titus, the man who doesn't do anything. Darian Bloodaxe, the man who doesn't do anything. Devra Bloodaxe, the woman who doesn't do anything. Re, the woman who doesn't do anything. And Anthony Botkins, the robot who doesn't do anything. The characters are almost universally idiots whose actions are often impossible to understand either because they simply don't make sense or because neither they nor any other characters seem aware of what is happening. First off, Korra. Korra is the protagonist. She is the Obi-Wan character who failed in her past and is now living in hiding, before the events of the film prompt her to pick up her weapon once more. We see that Korra is dedicated to her new life as a farmer, and that she distances herself from people as she does not want anyone to get hurt. She feels guilty about her failure to protect Princess Issa, and she ended up deserting at an unspecified point and for an unspecified reason that may or may not be explained in part two. As I explored earlier, her guilt is established as a core tenet of her character, but it does not play into any of her major decisions after she embarks on her quest. We are told that she is one of the most dangerous warriors in the history of armed conflict, although how and why this is the case is entirely unknown as we have no reason to believe that Korra would have received any more advanced training than the other soldiers of the Imperium. And she is repeatedly shown to be an idiot, which is, of course, unintentional. Korra appears on screen for a staggering 1 hour 27 minutes and 48 seconds, which, for reference, is comparable to the time spent with Thorin Oakenshield in the Hobbit trilogy and the time we spend with Jinx in all of Arcane Season 1. Did I mention my next video series is going to be on Arcane? Well, yeah, my next video series is going to be on Arcane, so if you want to see that, hit the subscribe button, and thank you Zack Snyder for releasing a film so terrible that I had to delay my series on Arcane. I cannot think of another character in film or TV that has received so much screen time with such little development. Even the worst characters in Rings of Power that had a high amount of screen time, such as Nori, Arendir, and Elrond, all had development. Much of the development was shit, much of it was contradictory, but it was at least present in the show. Conversely, you could watch the first and last few minutes of Rebel Moon and know virtually all there is to know about Korra. Gunner is the secondary protagonist, and aside from a handful of extremely dumb decisions that can be somewhat hand-waved due to his lack of experience, he is probably the best character in the film. Gunner is a farmer and is used as a fish-out-of-water protagonist, a lens for the writers to allow for the audience to understand the world, much like Luke Skywalker in A New Hope. However, in stark contrast to Luke Skywalker, the writers rarely, if ever, actually use him effectively for this purpose. Partly because he almost exclusively speaks to Korra, and partly because he never reacts to any of the insane bullshit that the film throws his way. The one time we get a sense that Gunner is a fish out of water is when he is on Kai's ship for the first time, and he doesn't really know what to do. You ever been off planet? No. What did you do on the farm? Oh, I oversee the harvest of That the sounds great. You might want to hold that. Other than that, grabby robot chair, not only does he know exactly what it is, but he also knows exactly how it works. 
a goddamn hippogriff? Yeah, I'm just not going to react to that whatsoever. Giant child-eating spider lady? Yeah, we get those all the time on the farm. In terms of his personality, he seems to clearly fancy Cora and is generally very nervous around her. He is an opportunist, as evidenced by his activities selling grain and attempting to convince the villagers to milk the Imperium for profit. He is also one of the only characters to have an arc, although his arc is incredibly simple. He explicitly states at the start, Well, I'm no revolutionary. And he ends up risking his life fighting against the Imperium. He appears to have been swayed by Korra's dedication, and this, plus the fact that he wants to harvest her cornhole, meant that he reassessed his priorities. Despite being probably the most fleshed out character in Rebel Moon, the amount of characterization we receive for Gunner is absolutely pathetic, given his 59 minutes of screen time. Prince Tarak Decimus is the first of many hilariously underdeveloped non-characters. He doesn't like the Imperium, he apparently has feelings of guilt, and he cares about animals but also leaves animals in the hands of obviously bad people. That is it. So as to avoid accusations of being hyperbolic, I will now play for you every line of dialogue that Tarak delivers after he is recruited by Korra. Maybe this isn't suicide after all. Honor them with everything that you can from now. Carry them. It's almost a shame you killed that son of a bitch noble and we don't have to fight. Oh, that was... That was amazing. Well, we've got one here. I know a thing or two about the guilt of carrying on when those you sworn to fight with are gone. Ah, uh, you thanks, Gunnar. You know, I never did trust that pilot. This would have been a beautiful place to die. Tarak has more screen time than Vanda in Arcane, And I'm just gonna move on because I find that fact very depressing. Kai is introduced very much as a Han Solo type in that he is a roguish smuggler with questionable morals, a cynical view of the idea of rebellion, and a love of money. When I say a Han Solo type, I mean Kai is the idea of Han Solo superficially plonked into a Zack Snyder film and consequently written to be a moron. He is a reluctant smuggler who is only in it for the money, but because this is a more mature take on Star Wars, instead of heroically saving the day at the end, Kai instead betrays everyone because money. I have already explored his plan, so I will move on to Kai's personality. He doesn't have one. In a film filled with non-characters who don't do anything, no character has earned that dubious honor more thoroughly than the hilariously named Nemesis. Here is everything Nemesis says after she is recruited by Korra. What will they do now? No, I am not joking. That is literally it. Number of words spoken is of course not the only metric that matters when it comes to characterization. There are of course many great characters that rarely or never speak. The reason why this is so funny to me with specific regard to Nemesis is that she also doesn't do anything. She agrees to join Korra for unknown reasons, she stands around silently for an hour, and then she fights the soldiers at the end. All we know of her character is that she killed a bunch of Imperium soldiers to avenge her children. That is literally, and I do mean literally, it. Nemesis is on screen for 32 minutes, and the only thing I can tell you about her is that she is sad because her children died. Admiral Atticus Noble is the primary antagonist of Rebel Moon, and like every other character, he is both laughably simplistic and underdeveloped. His goal is to become a senator, and he is really, really evil. He likes sexing tentacle monsters, he might actually be invincible given the way the film ends, and he really wants to capture Korra to impress Balisarius. Aside from acting like a clown in some scenes, he doesn't really have any notable personality to speak of. He is the stereotypical ruthless evil bad man who does ruthless evil bad things so that the goodies have something to fight against, and nothing more. General Titus, true to form, is characterized almost entirely by what we are told he did before the film started. He fought against the mother world, he doesn't like the Imperium, and he wants revenge. We are also told at the end that he is a genius, although we never see him do anything that would support this statement. Like Tarak and Nemesis, he says virtually nothing after he is recruited. Here is a quick compilation. Criminals, nobody's standing against a machine of war. This was a blow to the mother world, what we did this day. This is more than just a foreign prick officer and some of his men. This small act of defiance gives voice to the voiceless. It's the beginning 
of something. You still get paid, I presume? I've been wondering, is what that dead bounty hunter said true? That you're Athelias. Don't call me General. General Titus is a backstory without a character. He is a MacGuffin that prompts Korra's mission, and he is never explored at all. And that's it for characters. There are only so many ways I can say this character has absolutely nothing to them. I have nothing further to say regarding Darian Bloodaxe, Sindri, Hagen, Anthony Botkins, Balisarius, or any of the other faces that appear on screen with nothing behind their eyes. Rather than just repeat myself, I will conclude the character section with this. It has gotten to the point where I have no idea if Zack Snyder even understands his own characters. Easily my favourite Zack Snyder film is 300, which I know he didn't write and I know the characters in 300 are pretty thin, but I would expect that he would have some kind of insight or grasp as to who the characters in 300 are. If I were to ask Zack Snyder to tell me about King Leonidas, I imagine the conversation might go something like this. He fought against all odds versus a massive army. No, no, Zack, that's a thing he did. I want you to tell me about his character. Oh, uh, he has a really cool shield and helmet. No, Zack, that's the stuff he's wearing. I want to know what you think of the character. Hmm, uh, okay, when he was a boy, he killed a wolf. No, Zack, you're just telling me things that a character did. I'm trying to get to why he does what he does. What does he prioritize in life? What does he like and why? What does he dislike and why? Does he change throughout the film? If so, why? If not, why? Um, am I, am I getting through to you at all, Zack? 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 <laughs> Rebel Moon Part 1 A Child of Fire is undiluted Zack Snyder. It has an extremely thin plot that consists of one part half-baked ideas and two parts utter fucking nonsense. It barely has what would constitute characters, and rather than containing world building, it contains world breaking. The film plays like a Bioware RPG, where the player character, Korra, rounds up a bunch of colourful NPCs to help on her mission. But then for some reason she never speaks to any of them, meaning that where there was in some instances potential, these characters absolutely come across like NPCs with no voice lines. They have a purely visual component. They have the appearance of the actors and actresses, and they have their costumes. They have no personalities, no specific goals, no worldviews, just a vague desire to fight evil. Virtually all of the dialogue is entirely utilitarian. We never explore anything meaningful about any of the characters. It is always, where is the thingy? It is on planet Glorp Glob. How do you know? Because I am from planet Glorp Glob, or something to that effect. The reason the plot happens is because Admiral Noble went to Velt to get food, a decision that doesn't make sense, and because Velt was also the location where Korra, the most wanted person in the universe, was hiding. This is astronomically unlikely and relies on Noble doing things that he would have no reason to do. The repeated attempts to be mature only serve to come across as cringy and edgy, and they are only superficially mature. Rebel Moon is mature in the same way that a blood spatter warrants a higher age rating. We have the village of people who sex each other as a part of a tribute to their harvest. We have multiple characters plagued with feelings of guilt with what are ostensibly very dark pasts. We have multiple references to rape and sexual abuse. We have a deranged and potentially suicidally violent antagonist. And we have the heavily implied sexing of a tentacle monster. All of this is absolutely surface level. There is no substance or depth to any of the so-called maturity that is presented. Rebel Moon is as mature as an image of a nipple. The film is not in any way thematically mature. Although, to be honest, there isn't really any kind of thematic component to this film beyond goodies fight baddies. So the final question is, where can this go in Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scar Giver? I can't even begin to guess. But my expectations can't possibly get any lower, so in theory, at least, I may be pleasantly surprised.
Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you have enjoyed. This video was not originally going to be my follow-up after completing the Hobbit series, but you can thank Zack Snyder for making a film so catastrophically terrible that it made me reschedule. Unless the same thing happens again in the next month or two, my next video will be the first in a series covering season one of Arcane and explaining what makes it so exceptional. Anyway, please drop me a like, sub, and share if you did make it this far. Thank you again so much for your time, and I will see you in my next video.